pray. Heavenly Father, we've we've sung of your faithfulness and your sovereignty. We've we've prayed to you already to give you thanks for your faithfulness and your sovereignty. And and we we want to do that again. We want to give you praise. We want to praise your name and we we want to ask that you would help us afresh to see your greatness and your goodness. Help us to see your faithfulness and your love. Help us to see that your love never ends. Help us to see that there's nothing that you cannot do. Would you, would you build our vision of your greatness this morning, we pray. Help us to, to see wonderful things, wonderful truths in your word. Thank you that you're the God who speaks, and we pray that you would speak to us now. We pray that you would do us good from your word. Amen. Amen. Uh, if, if you wanted to get a good um, overview of, of the book of Daniel and where it fits in the Bible story, if you head to our website, you'll, you'll find a video that Carl and Lizzie very kindly put together that does exactly that. So let me encourage you to do that um, uh, if, if you've not uh, looked at it already. But we find in Daniel chapter one, um, Babylon is the superpower. The kingdom of God's people had been divided some years earlier. Israel in the north had been taken captive by the Assyrians, uh, by, by the Assyrians 100 years earlier. Now King Nebuchadnezzar has taken control of tiny Judah. Even the articles from the temple are, are grabbed and put in Nebuchadnezzar's temple to his gods as if to rub salt into the wounds to God's people and say, my God's better than your God's. And you can read about all this in, in 2 Kings, 2 Kings 25. And actually, as you read in 2 Kings 25, you get a sense of the ruthlessness of Nebuchadnezzar. So King Zedekiah, uh, the, the city's being besieged, the walls are breached, the, Nebuchadnezzar's army's pouring in, Zedekiah flees the city. He's captured, taken to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar that kills Zedekiah's sons before his eyes. And then he gouges out Zedekiah's eyes. So that's the last thing that he sees. That's pretty cold, isn't it? That, that you get a sense of how ruthless and brutal this guy is. And actually from the first seven verses here, we get a sense of what his longer term plan is. To overcome tiny Judah just by military force is, is not enough for him. Because if they continue trying to resist him, well, it's going to take more and more of his um, energy and resources to keep them under control. So what does he do? Well, he weakens their longer term prospects by exiling, by, by taking into captivity the sons of the nobility, the, the future leaders. So have a look at verses three and four. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, as king of the uh, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing an aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. <laughs> do you see what he's trying to do? Get these young men. Handsome, bright, intelligent, able. Looking around here, probably we'd probably be safe. Um, <laughs> but um, just to put you at ease, but um, he gets so he gets these bright, intelligent, well-born guys, and he he wants to isolate them from the influence of their god. He wants to indoctrinate them in the Babylonian way of thinking. He wants to wow them with a level of luxury they've never seen before. He wants to give them new identities. He wants them to forget their God. <clears throat> forget your God. He, he couldn't save you. This is the new reality now. Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's the one that's really in power. And so that's the situation we find these young guys in. And they would have been young guys, probably even teenagers, like Ruth's age, guys, far from home, 
strange land, strange culture, strange food. What's going to happen? How are they going to respond? Well, this morning, what, what, what I want to focus on is what we can learn from these guys' example about what it looks like to live distinctively for God in a hostile world. Because increasingly, we, we today are exiles and strangers, as 1 Peter says, living in, in a hostile world. So how can we live distinctively for the Lord in a hostile land? Well, I wonder how, how you might have responded in that situation, in that totally alien environment, scared, confused, perhaps doubting all that you'd grown up believing. It would have been easy for, for these guys to just segregate off and just become a kind of isolated Jewish ghetto in, in the midst of, of bustling Babylon. Maybe if we just kind of stick together, keep our heads down, just keep out of trouble, maybe that, that, that's the way forward. But the first thing we notice from these guys' response is that they don't hide. They don't hide. Now, when, when we're studying the book of Daniel, and, and this chapter in particular, sometimes we can jump too quickly to verse 8 and to the stand that, that Daniel courageously makes. But before we see what he says no to, we need to spend a bit of time thinking about what he says yes to. Because Daniel and these guys, they didn't retreat and withdraw completely from the outside world into a holy huddle and <coughs> a comfortable bubble. Firstly, we see these people, they didn't hide. First of all, they said yes to a pagan education. The language and literature of Babylonians, verse 4, has, has, again, it's this clever strategy from Nebuchadnezzar to indoctrinate the, the elite of, of his enemies into your own ways. No doubt this uh, education would have included all kinds of weird and wonderful stuff. Maybe sorcery, divination, all, all kinds of weird things there, but also incredible insights and wisdom gleaned from a very powerful and far-reaching empire. Daniel and his, his buddies, they are happy to engage with that education they were given rather than refuse it. As you look through, back through history, uh, often you can, you can uh, see the response of Christian groups during uh, different parts of history is, is to just kind of shut themselves off from the world. I guess if you kind of Think of groups that kind of do that. Think of maybe the Amish community in the US or um, perhaps really strict Plymouth Brethren in, in this country. Um, shutting out the world, having nothing to do with them, just. But rather than, rather than doing that, rather than hiding away and having nothing to do with the culture around, they got stuck in. They got engaged with it. I wonder what the lessons might be for us from that. Are there things that we can learn and pick up from that? Because it can be tempting to, to hide away, or to remove ourselves or to remove our children from the world's <coughs> influence, uh, perhaps especially in, when it comes to, to education. Now, as parents, we make decisions about uh, education based on our children's needs and our sense of what's best for them, don't we? But let's make sure that we're, we're not um, teaching our children to, to hide away out of the world. Well, let's be teaching and modelling to our children how to engage biblically with what's going on in the world around them. What can we affirm? What must we deny? For example, maybe um, uh, if your kids are in primary school and um, there's a trip coming up and you're just not quite sure about the place that they're going and what's going to be said and that kind of thing well why not offer to help on that trip if your primary school is anything like my kids primary school they are desperate for parents to come and help out on trips like that so why not come firsthand see what's said see what there's what's done and then you're in a great position to be able to talk with your kid kids um, afterwards about how they found it and what we can affirm, what we can deny, that kind of thing as well. 
And as our children get older, to be honest, it gets harder to do this kind of thing, doesn't it? But perhaps we're worried about what, what will be taught about sexuality and gender and things like that at, at, at secondary school. Well, let's make sure that we are having conversations with our kids about these things. I don't know if you've come across um, Ed Drew's book, Raising Confident Kids in a Confusing World. And uh, let me really uh, heartily recommend this book. You can find it actually on our, on our online bookstore. There's a quote um, from here. Ed uh, comes along to the afternoon service. Actually, many of you will probably know him. But uh, one of the things he says is that someone will be teaching your kids about their souls and their bodies. Make sure it's you. That's what it says. That's um, striking, isn't it? So head to the Faith in Kids website, um, talk to Ed, uh, head to the Good Book Company. There's, there's a wealth of resources out there that we can make use of to help us as we seek to help our kids engage with their education and what they're learning and, and what the world around is, is bombarding them with. Um, there's, there's great podcasts to listen to as well. And the Speak Life podcast is a great podcast for engaging in culture and understanding. Again, you'll find some of these links on our, on our websites. So these guys, they don't hide away. They said yes to a pagan education. Look what else they said yes to. Verse seven, new names. They're happy to have these new names. Now, names are often important and significant in, uh, in, in Bible times. And we can see, actually, as we kind of look at these names and we look at the new names that Nebuchadnezzar is giving them, that there's deliberate attempts to distort their names. So in Hebrew, El or, or Yah are, are Hebrew words for God. Um, so Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Daniel means uh, the Lord is my judge. Hananiah means beloved by the Lord. Mishael, who is as the Lord. Azariah, the Lord is my help. Well, in the Babylonian culture, Bel, Aku, Negu, they're Babylonian gods. And so Daniel is Bel to Shazam, um, Shadrach, um, illumined by the Aku sun god. That's how it could be translated. Meshach, who is like Aku, Abednego, servant of Nego. Do you see what he's doing? <coughs> Trying to twist, distort their names, give them new identities. And uh, it's fascinating. Daniel and Coda, yeah. they're happy to go with these, these new names because actually they're secure in, in their identity, as, as we'll see. So they say yes to new names, yes to a pagan education. And finally, they say yes to working for the king, to, for entering his, serv his service. They don't hide away. They get stuck right in. And actually, that's exactly what the Lord wanted them to do. So Jeremiah 29 is uh, the letter to the exiles, as it's called. Have a look at these verses up on the screen. Jeremiah 29, 4 to 7. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because it, if it prospers, you too will prosper. It's fascinating, isn't it? Seek the prosperity of the city. Get on with life. Work hard. We are aliens and strangers, as the Apostle Peter tells us. The new heaven, the new earth, that's our true home. And we are living in an increasingly hostile world. We're in exile. And we're not to, to hide away, we're to engage. But secondly, they don't hide away. But secondly, they don't compromise. They don't compromise either. Throughout history, Christians have been guilty of hiding themselves away. 
but also guilty of making the, the opposite mistake. Christians in, in history have let themselves be squeezed into the mold of the world around to be compromised and given up on making a stand when they needed to, and so lost all their distinctiveness. Daniel and his friends fully engaged with their new world. They said yes to a new education and name, working for the king, but they also said no when they needed to and didn't compromise. Verse eight. And he, he resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Now, interestingly, it's, it's unclear as to exactly what the problem was here, what it was that he was opposed to that, that, that led to him making this stand. Uh, some said well, perhaps it was a dietary problem and that the, the meat that would have been served up probably wouldn't have been kosher, so maybe that's off limits for, for Jews. Well, the wine would have been fine, so why is he, why is he rejecting that as well? Um, maybe it's religious, that was the problem, that um, the food and the wine would have been offered to idols first. Um, well, why is he happy to eat the vegetables? Because they would have been offered to the, the idols too. Maybe it's more a symbolic thing that uh, to be seen to be kind of sharing the king's food is, is too much. It's too much a, an assimilation. He wants to be, remain distinctive and not totally squeezed into Babylon's mold. It's not entirely clear what his problem is, what the, what the issue is. But what is important, what the crucial thing is, is that he decided to take a stand and he resolved not to compromise. There, there, were the, there came a line in the sand and, and that he refused to, to cross that. That's the vital thing here. We'll think about it a bit more uh, detail shortly, but, but I want us to see how he goes about it as well. Notice how he explains to the guards. Uh, he's extraordinarily gracious with this man. He doesn't make a big song and dance about it. And this guy is scared. He knows Nebuchadnezzar. He knows how ruthless he is. He knows a failure to do his duty is the end of his life. He knows how vicious Nebuchadnezzar could be. Daniel takes time to explain graciously what's going on, sets up this kind of 10-day test, which they pass with, <clears throat> with flying colours in the Lord's sovereignty and goodness. So the important thing is Daniel makes a stand. He makes a stand. And it's in the small things to begin with. In the small things. Because God is concerned with the ordinary and the mundane as much as he is with the extraordinary and the huge things going on. And for Daniel and his friends, their faithfulness <coughs> in the small things here is surely what helps them later on when they face the fiery furnace and den of lions. One commentator, um, Sinclair Ferguson, puts it like this. Without those early steps of faithfulness to their Lord, there would be no record of their later heroism. Scripture does not give us these details of their early years accidentally. It does so in order to teach us that growth in grace and usefulness in God's service does not begin in the world of our dreams, but in the context of life's harsh historical realities. So it was for Daniel, so it will be also for the Daniels of today. That's, that's, that's striking, isn't it? The growth in grace and usefulness in God's service doesn't begin in the world of our dreams, but in the context of life's harsh historical realities. Well, I wonder what it might mean for us. Where might we be tempted to compromise? We're called to be salt and light, to be distinctive, to be holy because... Our, our father is, is holy and we need to engage with our world, but we cannot compromise at the same time. Have a look at verse eight. Again, look at the language that's used here. Daniel resolved. Daniel resolved. As the uh, older translation says, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. That's great, isn't it? Daniel purposed in his heart. 
this isn't something that's just a whim. He just thought, oh, you know what? I don't really fancy the meat and wine. I'm just going to stick with the bit. This is, this is a decision he has thought deeply about. This is something he has prayed through. We get a, an amazing sense that Daniel is a man of prayer as you go right through the rest of the book. This is, this is something that is clearly important to him. He's purpose in his heart not to defile himself. Did you notice that? Uh, that's how he describes it. Defile himself. This, this is sort of Old Testament sacrificial system language. Defile himself, the idea of, of being polluted or, or contaminated, becoming impure, something coming in the way of his relationship with God. He was concerned his relationship with God was, was, was going to be threatened. So he purposed in his heart not to defile himself in this way. I wonder where where are we? Where, where am I tempted to compromise on on our relationship with God? I remember um, a, a friend of mine worked um, extremely hard for a prestigious firm, demanding job, lots of responsibility, and for him, he was. Uh, really committed to his home group and he resolved to make home group a priority and so he resolved he purposed in his heart to make home group night on a Wednesday that he would leave 5 30 whatever else is happening on at work so he can be be uh, one night a week his priority is not his job but his his relationship with God and the community of, of his people. And for this guy, that's the, that was the stand he decided to make. And that's not easy. But that was the line, the line that he drew in the sand. That is where he said no. I wonder what it might be for us here today. Where's the pressure on, on your relationship with God? What, what are the small things that he's calling us to be? faithful in i wonder at work the uh how tempting it is to just sort of give fake promises over the phone oh, the order's gone i've that emails it must be in your spam i'm sure i sent it and those are, sorry my boss is not in at the moment when it's just sort of sat behind you um <laughs> well there's lots we can learn from Daniel about living in a hostile world, from what he said yes to and what he said no to. And it's challenging for us to think through these things and what it means for us today. But the star of this book is not Daniel. Fantastic though his example is. The star of the story is God himself. And we come back to the hidden realities that we were thinking about last week. The underlying reason that Daniel is able to live the way he does it's because he trusts in the hidden realities that we were thinking about last week, that the Lord <laughs> reigns even in a hostile world. That's the big theme of this book. That's what you see as you go through the first six chapters of the narrative. It's also the theme in the, in the remaining prophetic chapters as well. It would have been very easy for Daniel to doubt that, that the Lord is the God who reigns, given the circumstances he was in, very understandable. But Daniel doesn't doubt. He trusts. He trusts that how God reigns. And so we, uh, through this chapter, we see God's sovereignty, that, that he reigns over nations. Again, like we were seeing last, last week in verse 2, and the Lord gave. It was the Lord who was in control of everything that's going on there. Nebuchadnezzar is not the one that's in control. He's doing the besieging, but it's the Lord that gave them into his hands. The Lord is the one who reigns, who's in control. And actually we'll, we'll see Nebuchadnezzar come to realize that himself in a couple of chapters time. The Lord's in control. This whole exile is something that he promised would happen because <laughs> of God's people's rejection of him and their sin and their failure to keep the, the commands. Look, 
as we were think, looking for when we were looking at um, the book of Habakkuk earlier this this year in, in July. This, this is what Habakkuk was told was going to happen. This is God's judgment for their deliberate turning away from him. So we see God's sovereignty over nations. We trust in the Lord who reigns. So let's not have too small a view of God. He's the God of the impossible, who is, who is utterly sovereign, who is in control. So actually, when we come to him, we can pray with supreme confidence that nothing takes him by surprise, that no one or nothing is outside of, of his control. He and he reigns over individuals. He has the weight of the universe on his shoulders, the affairs of nations, but he is personally interested in individuals too. Have a look at verse 9. Um, now, God had caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel. God gave Daniel favour in the eyes of the official. And verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. God gave knowledge and understanding. God's the one pulling the strings here. So verse 2, verse 9, verse 17, God gave on a national scale and on an individual scale as well. It's wonderful, isn't it? His sovereignty and his grace and his his faithfulness and his care for his people. What encouragement, what strength we can draw from, from this truth. This, this is our God host, who's reigning in this hostile world. And there's real irony, actually, as you read through this, this whole chapter. Remember Nebuchadnezzar at the start of the chapter wanting to get the guys from this tiny subjugated Judah to forget God. And to assimilate into Babylonian life. And yet by the end of the chapter, these few, far from forgetting God, are trusting in him. Are showing their allegiance to, to him above Nebuchadnezzar, above all. And these are the ones who are ten times better than everyone else around. Who are, who are at the throne room, at the seat of power and influence. Working out God's purposes in their lives and actually in his purposes for, for his whole people here as well. Verse 21, uh, first year of King Cyrus, that's when the exiles returned. Nebuchadnezzar's trying to get these guys to just forget God. And yet here they are, these few, trusting him, living, living for him. It's extraordinary, isn't it? God reigns. God reigns. This is the hidden reality that's going on there. God reigns. And he can work and he can change and he can influence and he can help and he, and he can encourage. And Daniel knew that truth. He trusted that hidden reality that God reigns, that he's the one that's the <laughs> ultimate control. And that shaped the way he lived, the choices that he makes. And it came down to a simple choice, really, for Daniel. Who did he fear most? Who does he fear most? Is it God or Nebuchadnezzar? And the stand that he takes here shows us that his primary allegiance is to the Lord God and not to, to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel feared God more than Nebuchadnezzar, more than Babylon. His identity was so squarely rooted in his, in his love for the Lord, in, in, in the Lord's sovereignty, in the Lord's faithfulness and goodness. He knew the Lord reigns, not Nebuchadnezzar. And so for him, he's able to make this courageous stand. That's what gave him the strength to do it, even though it undoubtedly would have been hard. And again, the challenge for us is, well, who do we fear? most it's easy to fear god on a sunday gather together praising his name together it's it's, it's wonderful it's great it's easy to fear god there but what about tomorrow morning when we're alone when we're far from home what do the decisions that we make and the things that we find ourselves thinking about most often 
reveal about who or what we, we fear most? What is it we daydream about? What is it we spend our money on? What is it we spend our time on? What, what are we worried about? What do those things reveal about where our primary allegiance is, who we're fearing most of all? They're, they're big questions, aren't they? But ultimately, we have far more reasons and, and evidence than Daniel and his, 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 his friends did of God's love and his sovereignty, because we can look back to the cross of Christ, just as we sung before uh, looking at this passage together. The cross shows his supreme authority, defeating sin and death once and for all. And it shows his love for you and for me individually, too, because Jesus our, our wonderful saviour, he thought of you, he, he thought of me, and he gave his life for you, for me. And actually it's his death that makes it possible for us to be in a relationship with, with the sovereign Lord in the first place. Not a courageous act of heroism that we might try to do for him. The danger sometimes of looking at these heroes of faith stories is that we miss grace. And we think that his acceptance of us is, is based on whether or not we can dare to be a Daniel. The truth is God's the hero. He's always the hero. And he accepts us because of the Lord Jesus, because he poured himself out for us. And actually that's the of our of our identity. We, we're, we're already in a relationship with him. We're already accepted. And he calls us to live for him. In this hostile land, not to hide away, not to compromise, but to <laughs> let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for. The example of Daniel and his friends, we want to thank you for their courage. Oh, I'm going to wrap a minute. Why does it keep doing that?